Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big Joe's Journal. We're headed into the uh, final week of the month of May, hard to believe. The year's been flying right by. But um, a week from today will be Memorial Day. And Memorial Day is a day in which we, we uh, remember those that have gone before us, primarily those who have given their lives to the military and service to the country. Memorial Day formerly used to be known as Decoration Day. And around here in Vermont, of course, it was usually the first big holiday of the summer. You had Memorial Day, you had July 4th, and then, of course, it concluded with Labor Day. <clears throat> Memorial Day originally began in the, uh, began in the South right after uh, the Civil War, when a group of Confederate widows decided to honor the uh, Confederate soldiers who had given their lives in a losing cause, and actually a rather poor cause, probably the poorest cause that anybody could give their life for. That was the preservation of slavery. And uh, the Confederate Memorial Day was, was held in February. Well, in response to that, the folks in the North, to honor the Union dead, established a Memorial Day, and they established it uh, originally, it was on the 30th of May. And a few years ago, in order to make it a long weekend, the first weekend of summer, it was put at the last Monday of the month of May. So on this uh, Memorial Day, of course, we remember not only those who have given their lives in, in uh, service to the country, made the supreme sacrifice, and some of our finest young men and women have made that supreme sacrifice. But we also remember our own beloved deceased, our own family members, our parents, grandparents, children. Well, the worst thing a parent has to do is to bury a child. And unfortunately, uh, there's been too much of that lately. But we remember all of our beloved deceased on Memorial Day and on this particular Memorial Day coming up, the weather forecast predicts a very summer-like weekend. And we hope that uh, everybody will look back at those who have gone before us and uh, pave the way for the rest of us and certainly a, a day to be commemorated. You know, when I, was, uh, when I was a child in grade school at Christ the King, they always had a big parade <coughs> on Memorial Day. You had the Rutland City Band, you had high school bands, Rutland High, Mount St. Joseph. And uh, there was a um, drum and bugle corps. I think they call themselves the Scarlet Knights. And there's also the 40th Army Band, which at that time was based in Proctor. And the parade house began up in Main Street Park. Went down West Street, down to Merchant's Row, made a left turn on Merchant's Row. Went down the length of Merchant's Row, made a left turn on Washington Street. And those of you that have seen pictures of City Hall facing Washington Street, you know there's a little balcony up above the uh, the entry there on Washington Street. And that's where the uh, city officials used to be observing the, uh, the parade. And we went up Washington Street, cut back over through the park, over to the armory, and that's where the, <coughs> excuse me, the Memorial Day, <coughs> the Memorial Day uh, speeches and everything were held. Then following that, the Rowland City Band led the parade back down West Street to West Street Cemetery, and there flowers were placed on a selected grave site of, well, probably one of the folks who died in the American Revolution. And that was Memorial Day back then. Of course, um, back in those days, <clears throat> the Rowland City Police used to have a mounted patrol. 
And of course, I went to Christ the King and the holy nuns there. And they always used to tell us, watch where you step. Watch where you're going. You know, see, police officers led the parade on horseback and everybody else followed behind. So that was Memorial Day then. Well, it's a little bit, a little bit quieter now. One of the traditions of Memorial Day, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is the Indianapolis 500. And that is going to be run on Sunday the 30th. And that was the tradition for many, many years. Um, <clears throat> So those of you that are into, into auto racing, um, you'll have that Sunday. I believe it uh, starts around 11 a.m. Sunday morning. And the cars are a lot different than what they used to be. The old days, of course, they had the Offenhausers. And, and each year, they've gotten a little better, a little faster. And uh, well, we'll see who wins this year. The last few years, there's been a number of uh, people from other countries that have uh, walked away with the Indianapolis 500 uh, championship. So we'll see what happens this year. And that is Memorial Day. <clears throat> well, today for me is my 924th show. And one of the things I wanted to do was hit 1,000, but that was not in the cards. And that's probably my biggest disappointment. I was unable to hit 1,000 shows, but 924 is not a bad number. I've been here, Peg TV, for 24 years. And that's hard to believe, too. The way time flies, it seems like yesterday, when we were up at the Stafford Technical Center, and uh, <clears throat> after the political campaign of 1996, I was um, vice chair of the Rutland County Democratic Committee. <clears throat> and we, we decided what we had to do to create better visibility for our candidates. Because Republicans were pretty well dominating the elections in the county. And so the best way to do that, of course, was Peg TV. <clears throat> At that time, there was just one channel. I was channel 15. And so I went to talk to the late Mike Valentine about setting up a program. And he was very helpful and very, very cooperative. And so we went on the air. And uh, first program, I was co-host. My co-host was uh, Maureen Kiki McShane. And our first guest was Cheryl Hooker. Uh, Cheryl had been elected to the uh, state senate for the first time in uh, 1996. And so she was our first guest. And since that time, we've had a number of guests. Uh, Kiki left after about 12 episodes. And I took over hosting the program by myself. And for a while we had, we had guests and we're very, very fortunate to have some wonderful guests. Former Governor Jim Douglas, who was a guest uh, three or four times. Former Lieutenant Governor Brian Doobie. Former Lieutenant Governor Doug Racine. Um, former City Representative Steve Howard, former Speaker of the House, Mike Obahowski, and former Mayor Wenberg was also a guest at one time. And I think the number of guests we had, and um, well, you know, I'm not going to get everybody. But we had from various uh, aspects of life. We had a couple of professors coming over from Green Mountain College, which is now closed, to 
talk about the environment and climate change and stuff like that. And we've had a number of other uh, influential guests to come in and talk about uh, topics that were on people's minds at the time. Well, after a while, the show progressed on. We went to doing a show without, without bringing in guests. It became a little more difficult to uh, get guests, and sometimes they would show, and sometimes they wouldn't, and sometimes they'd come in late. So in order to uh, have a set time to tape the program and sort of uh, dispense with having guests, and <clears throat> I think that, is, uh, that has worked out, and that is the way we're winding up. So I'm getting around to saying, of course, this, this will be my last show. And I'm very, very disappointed in that. But um, today I'm 88 years old. And I'm very thankful to God that he's given me 88 years on this earth. It's 88 years that's seen high points and seen low points. Seen times of struggle. Times of happiness. Times of success and times of failure, like any other life. I was very fortunate for nearly 25 years to be married to Mary Elaine McDonald. And she uh, died in <clears throat> September 1994. And sometimes it seems like yesterday, and other times it seems like 100 years ago. But I was very fortunate in that regard. I was very fortunate to be able to work with some wonderful colleagues. Many have already gone to their rest. I know when I first started teaching, my first principal was a man by the name of David Wood of South Royalton High School. And South Royalton, of course, has, has since become a Union High School, is now the White River Union High School, and serves students from Rochester, Bethel, South Royalton. I, I, don't, I think Chelsea is still uh, running as an independent school. I've been privileged to serve as a teacher, I think I've taught everything under the sun. Although my major was uh, social studies and English, I've taught history and geography, civics, English, Latin. And the final 30 years of my career, I was very fortunate to, to get into driver education. and very fortunate to be able to work for some great people there. One principal I will always be grateful to, and that was at Pulteney High School. <clears throat> that was Frank Frezzi, who's now on the select board in Pulteney. Frank served in the Korean War. He was a Marine. He was wounded, wounded at the Chosin Reservoir up in North Korea. But Frank is um, a good principal and a very good leader. As most of your military, <laughs> military trained leaders are. I know he took over Pulteney High School at a time when uh, we were kind of floundering around with a series of principals and temporary principals. And Frank kind of stepped in and solidified the situation. I know he told me one time, he said, if you have any problems disciplining any of your students, he said, if you want to go up one side of them down the other, he says, fine. I just don't want to hear about it. I said, okay, chief, that's the way it is. But he was a good leader, a very influential leader. 
And I also think of many of the uh, teachers I had the privilege of working with. The late Ray Bunker from Fairhaven. Um, Ray had a very strong knack of being able to relate with kids, especially kids that were, were having a rough time. And something I always remember, <clears throat> that uh, he had a student in his class who was having a rough time at home. And the kid was kind of lost. Well, Ray was a old farm boy. And once in a while he'd bring some of his um, animals, you know, into class and so the kids could could uh, learn to take care of, you know, things like chickens and all that. Well, one day he brought a duck in. He had a duck in the box. And he said to this kid, he said, this duck is your responsibility. He says, I want you to take care of this duck. And that boy and that duck bonded. And you know, for once in his life, this student had something that he could do, and that he cared for. And that is all animals do, they give you back love 100%. You love them and they'll return that. Unconditional, unconditional love. And I always remember that because it, it had a very, very positive influence on that kid. And I don't know over the years what happened to that, that boy, but you know, I'm sure he turned out all right. Ray Bunker passed away um, two or three years ago. Another teacher I had the privilege of working with, that was Mike Perry. Mike was a science teacher. Mike died of cancer probably about five years ago. <clears throat> but Mike had a great way of relating with students. He was also not only an excellent teacher, but he was a great coach. And he put his students first, what their needs were, and how to relate with them, how to relate to them. I know back in 1996, when I was running for the Senate, Mike was running for the House of Representatives from out in Fairhaven, Castleton area. And I know uh, we campaigned together a couple of times, and <clears throat> it was a real, real pleasure. He was a fine, fine gentleman. And uh, Mike is one of these teachers, you know, that set the standard. And you try to reach that standard and live up to it. <clears throat> I think of my years in uh, driver ed, and I taught driver ed in a number of schools. Dallas Falls, Spalding High and Barrie. Middlebury Union High School, Bellis Free Academy in Fairfax, and I say in the news now, Bellis Free Academy is <clears throat> hiring a new principal. Also, uh, Springfield, Black River in Ludlow, Burn Burton in Manchester, Mill River here in Clarendon, and three schools where I spent most of my time. Poling High School, which was my main school, West Rutland, and Rutland High School. And I certainly had the uh, privilege of working with some great guys. <clears throat> I know Rutland High School, working with Dave Potter, former representative from the Clarendon area. Dave, very, very knowledgeable. He also taught science besides driver ed. And he was very, very active 
in the uh, Driver Ed Association. Um, Dave Trombley. Dave taught phys ed at Rutland High as well as Driver Ed. And certainly it was a pleasure working with those two guys. Every organization, of course, you know, has a, a group or a union or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and in driver education is the Vermont, is VDTSCA, Vermont Driver Training and Safety Education Association. And I had the privilege of uh, serving both as secretary and then as vice president, finally as president. And as president, I spent a bit of time in Montpelier testifying for the legislature, particularly the uh, House and Senate Education Committees and Transportation Committees. And working with the Department of Public Safety, we managed to get a number of things through the legislature. One was the mandatory seatbelt law and the law requiring uh, the young children having uh, <clears throat> safety seats so they're strapped in. I know the, uh, on the mandatory seatbelt law, at that time, a lady by the name of Flossie Robillard was one of the senators for Rutland County. And she hadn't been too keen on a mandatory seatbelt law. Especially some people want to put a fine in there. Say, if you forget, buckle your seatbelt, you're looking at a $25 fine. So on New Year's Day, I'm watching TV. I'm watching the Cotton Bowl. Notre Dame and Texas A&M are squaring off in the Cotton Bowl. And just before I kick off, the phone rings. That is Flossie Robillard. I said, how are you doing, Senator? Well, she said, I'm coming, away to, I'm coming over to your way of thinking. So I'm going to vote in favor of the mandatory seatbelt law. But she says, the thing I don't like is the fine. I said, well, fine. I said, you're in a position to take the fine out of there. I said, I'm not in favor of it. But the idea is that you wear a seatbelt, you're going to save lives. So why don't you just uh, eliminate that fine? And she said, well, I spent time with the Rutland City Fire Department. The Rutland City Fire Department used to maintain uh, emergency ambulances at that time. And she went on a couple of calls and she observed firsthand the effect that seatbelts can have. Uh, it can be the difference between death and life. And she swung over to that side. Well, I also want to, uh, some of the finest years of my life were the 10 years I spent on the Rutland City Board of Aldermen. And I had the privilege of working with many people who dedicated their lives to making Rutland a better community. And I'm glad to see that still going on with Project Vision and a number of other things. To put the time in, and there's a lot of time on the Board of Aldermen because you've got your committee meetings and everything else. And it was an honor for me to be elected to five terms on that board. And I'm very, very appreciative to the voters of the city of Rutland for that. They're serving on that board, you had a feeling of accomplishment when you got something done. And as I look at the things, say, well, what, what did you personally accomplish on it? Well, one of the things I accomplished, and not everybody agrees with me on that, and that was getting back the 10 of 9 curfew, which senior citizens wanted. We got that back. When we went from five reps down to four, sitting in with uh, then city engineer Alan Shelby and uh, Darlene Gregory, who was the city clerk, we redrew the voting wards in the city of Rutland that are still in effect today. Banning paintball and city parks. I had complaints of people in, up in Pine Hill Park out for a walk and somebody would pop out from behind a tree and bang with a paintball. So he pushed that through and got that done. And um, 
One of the other things that I was very proud to do, and that was to represent the city of Rutland on the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And on there, I served also on the Public Safety Committee for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I was very, very grateful for that. And last but not least, I want to thank the people here at PEG TV. It's been a wonderful, wonderful 24 years. I especially remember the late Mike Valentine and the wonderful work he did in helping me get started, getting the show going. My first engineer, Tom Lapel, who's now our executive director, doing a great job. Did a great job then and still doing a great job today. Chris McCormick. You know, Chris, is, uh, his dad was an experienced radio man over at WHWB, and Chris was on the uh, radio station in, in Poultney there for a while before moving over here to Rutland and then uh, joining the PEG TV staff when PEG TV went from, uh, from one channel Went to two, there's channel 21, and then channel 20, the education channel. And that's where Chris came in. And uh, I know Tom, all the years we've been here, uh, he's been fabulous. And I'm going to be very, very grateful to him for the help and for allowing this old man to come in here and mumble through a few words and so forth. And I also want to thank my current engineer, Chelsea Tice. Makes this show possible. Without her, wouldn't get on the air at all. And I'm very, very grateful to her. Certainly wish her the very best. I know she's got a great career ahead of her. And to all the other folks that have come and gone here in this Peg TV family, I want to thank you all. Thank you very much. It's never easy to say goodbye. It's never, never easy to acknowledge that as age has crept up on you, your um, ability to do certain things um, is just not there anymore. And for me, it's getting extremely hard to um, get around. In fact, I didn't think I was going to make this show today there for a while. Uh, <clears throat> I had kind of a bad fall yesterday on top of one I had two weeks ago. So I'm probably going to have to have a little shoulder surgery here coming up. And, a week or so. And yesterday, I like chocolate fraps. You know, that's chocolate ice cream with milk and stuff. Made a chocolate frap. Doggone, I didn't pick the thing up and I fell. And it went all over the floor. It made it very, very slippery. When I tried to get up, I fell again. And I, uh... anyway, Finally, I had to, you know, call the ambulance, get the ambulance to come over. And they want to take me up to the hospital. I said, well, no, I've, I've got things to do here, you know. I don't want to spend my 88th birthday in the Rutland Hospital. I've spent time up there before. Well, you know, and I, argue, I argued back, and I said, hey, look. I said, it's my choice. I'm the patient. I don't want to go. So they agreed to that, and I had to sign a waiver saying that I refused to uh, go to the hospital. And uh, so I did. And that's why I'm here today. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. And if you are determined enough, and you're ready to fight it enough, somewhere along the way, you're going to be able to do it. You just got to hang in there. There are times when you get discouraged. There are times when you want to throw in the towel and say, oh, well, that's it, can't do it. Well, that's when you want to uh, suck it up because you can do it. You make up your mind, you make up your will, you can do it. 
With that, I say goodbye for the final time. May God in his infinite wisdom continue to bless the United States of America. God love you. I know I do. And thank you all so very, very much. God love you.